Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well still, and welcome to tonight's middle of the night, or depending on wherever you may live, early morning bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go and folks, they do matter. Now everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into this middle of the night or early morning bonus upload, shall we? Let's go into the LBL first. Um, there are, or there is two structures there um, that sometimes people refer to as one. Uh, the names being Hotel California and the Vampire Hotel. A lot of times people will call one building both names. Well, there's two different structures. And I'm going to go over the Hotel California. There'll be two pictures in the description. And then at the Vampire Hotel, there'll be a picture of that in the description. And this is just a little bit of history about the LBL. We all know about the LBL, the attacks, so on. I've covered the LBL a couple of times. I just wanted to share a little bit more history with you guys on the LBL, just so you can be more familiar with the landscape. Um, because as beautiful as this land is, it is got some very, very eerie places to it. So these are some interesting travel articles that I found and I wanted to share with you to kind of just shine some light on these two interesting yet very creepy structures in the LBL. I received an email from a gentleman named TJ who, like us, enjoys exploring. He asked if I had ever been to the Hotel California in LBL and that he had found it. He went on to give me some pretty good directions and a link to someone's Flickr photos of the structure. I had heard of this place before but never felt the urge to investigate. Now that TJ provided me with an opportunity for a little adventure, I knew what we would be doing on our kidless Saturday. Getting to the Hotel California. My wife and I set out from our home for the northern end of LBL, the location of Hotel California was somewhere near Lake Barclay, Dumumbar's Bay. The directions TJ provided were pretty good. From the trace, we took LBL 112 and drove 1.7 miles to LBL 120. Then we began looking for an old logging lane that was just over a mile down the road. We saw three potential logging roads and weren't sure which one it was. Eventually, we ended up past Smith Cemetery. The road intersected with Old Kentucky 522, which today doesn't have an LBL road number assigned. It's basically an abandoned state highway that serves a couple of backcountry campsites, and I may add, some ideal tent locations. We turned around at this point and decided to pick the best-looking old logging road. We took an educated guess on which was the best way to get to Hotel California. The road was impassable, so we pulled off to the side and started walking. 
The trek was downhill for a bit until we ran into some trees and debris on the road. A foot trail veered off to the side, so we followed that. We crossed a dry ditch and continued to follow the trail until something in front of us began to show itself through the thick trees. We had arrived at Hotel California. First impressions were great. This had to be the largest remaining structure of its kind in LVL. It was two stories of built concrete block. There was a large porch area in the front and several rooms upstairs and downstairs. The building had been completely gutted with some very few minor exceptions. Nothing was left except the concrete. The building was intriguing because we didn't know what it was. It looked too blocky and square to be someone's home. In the front of the building was an abandoned well. Thankfully, the forest service had fenced it off, so no one could fall in. You could barely see the remains of a driveway leading up to the bottom and top levels of the structure. Upstairs were former restrooms, which still had some pipes in the wall, and some really old floor tile. The building had electric at one point. My wife and I were really only able to recognize the porch and the bathrooms upstairs and a possible garage on the bottom left. The second thing that quickly jumped out to us was the place is a haven for partygoers. There was profanity and graffiti everywhere. There had to be hundreds of beer bottles and beer cans scattered around the structure. A makeshift ladder ran to the roof where, at least on that day, a perfectly good camping chair was set on the top of the roof. The next thing that became obvious to me was a portion of this building was not structurally sound. The right front side of the building was being held up by a single concrete post that had been stripped down to rebar. I was not about to go frolicking on the top of this thing. And I swear that that corner of the building is sagging. So if you check this place out, I highly recommend not walking on the far right of the second floor. After spending about 30 minutes at the site, we decided it was time to head back. But not before I recorded the GPS coordinates of the structure. I also recorded the GPS cords for the old logging road that went to the building. Guys, those coordinates are in the description as well. So what was this thing? Clearly it was not a hotel, not quite big enough. But surely it wasn't a house due to the concrete block and somewhat fortified build. The following Monday I emailed the Heritage Program at the Land Between the Lakes and they shared with me that in fact it was a home. I couldn't believe it. The house was built sometime before the creation of the LBL by a riverboat captain named Grover Marlar. He had built this place as a retirement home for him and his wife. Jamie Bennett, the director of the Heritage Program, sent me an aerial photo of Mr. Marler's home when Lake Barclay was first flooded. I was also able to find a TVA archive photo of his home before it was purchased to create the LBL in the 60s, some 50-some years ago. When I saw the TVA photo, I was surprised. Some of the aspects of the home were unusual. Not to mention it was entirely built out of concrete block. Sliding glass doors dominated the front, the flat roof had a chain link fence around the top, and the porch rails were chain linked as well. We did correctly identify the garage area before we knew for sure what it was. The home had a driveway leading up from Old State Highway, Kentucky 522. The old logging road we took to the structure isn't on any of the old maps. Perhaps one of the most interesting revelations is this home at one time had a view of Lake Barclay. While we were there, we certainly couldn't see the lake and had no clue it was only a few hundred feet away. Now, just stay with me for a second. Something hit me as I stared at that old TVA photo of Mr. Marler's home. Can you imagine how he would have reacted if someone showed him a photo of his retirement home in the 21st century? Stunned and shocked. Did our country suffer an apocalypse? Did the rapture take place? What in the world happened? If you like visiting and exploring abandoned places, this is right up your alley. But before you go, remember this. Leave no trace. If you go, don't contribute to the hordes of beer cans and bottles already there. The place is a borderline dump. And 
don't test your artwork skills with spray paint either. Even a couple of the trees near the building had spray paint on them. Respect the property. Years ago, the blood, sweat, and tears of a retired riverboat captain went into this building, his dream home. Remember that when you walk around. Be safe. The second floor right side doesn't look too good. I wouldn't walk on it. We also noticed thousands of mud dauber nests with at least one active wasp nest. Consider not taking kids. Your children will be exposed to profanity, graphic depictions of vulgarity. Also, some artwork promoting Satanism. Sounds like a good time, right? The coordinates to the Hotel California uh, will be in the description. Now, let's move over to the Vampire Hotel. The Vampire Hotel moniker is an abandoned structure near Kentucky Lake in the LBL. The stone and concrete structure was partially torn down in the 60s with the creation of LBL, but part of it remains. It is one of just a handful of the remaining structures in the LBL not completely removed. Throughout the 90s, it became a popular hangout spot with locals, some of whom were less than reputable. The structure itself was a single-story home that belonged to Dorothy B. Keith. The stone and frame home was built sometime after the creation of Kentucky Lake post-1945 and was used as a vacation home. The home was fairly luxurious for its time. It featured a walkout basement into a stone arched shaped patio. In the middle of the patio was a cistern, which is still visible today. Bathrooms and staircase flanked the building going to the first level which contained a large chimney. The chimney also went down into the basement and had fireplaces on each side. Inside the basement was a large room with several large windows, which would provide a grand view of Kentucky Lake. The walkout basement was symmetrical, which would have suggested some type of commercial business, such as a hotel. The one exception to the symmetry was a room in the back of the basement toward the right. It's unclear what this room was used for, but what we do know is that it was a residential, not a hotel. Other features of the property include a sandbox to the north of the home, which is completely intact today. Also marked on the property sketch at the right is a location of the pathway roads leading to the home and a spot marked grill. The stone pathway is a paved road leading to the home and they are all still intact. A walkout basement was not torn down initially in the 60s and remained until sometime around 1997. So up until then, it was one of the few remaining covered structures in the LBL due to its close proximity to US 68 and its overall mysterious allure. It became a popular place to hang out. Despite numerous rumors and websites with inaccurate information, nothing substantial ever occurred at this site. Some of the rumors include animal sacrifices or blood drinking rituals, but no evidence was ever found, no vampires, murders, or anything of that nature. With Vampire Hotel sprayed across the front of the building, the site received national media attention in the late 96 and 97 after an infamous incident that did not occur at the site. We're not going into details of the incident, but the site clearly had nothing to do with it, despite the rumors. Certain individuals involved in that incident would hang out up there, but that was to the extent of it. National media attention included NBC's Unsolved Mysteries, which carried some footage from the site. After all the negative publicity, the remaining portion of the air quotations hotel all that remains today is a semi-circled wall that acted as a foundation to the patio. This location has become more difficult to access since US 68 Kentucky 80 has widened to four lanes over the last few years. I will include the GPS coordinates to the Vampire Hotel also in the description below. It should also be noted that at this location, as with all historical sites in the LBL, is an archaeological site that should be treated with respect. Special thanks to Jamie Bennett, Heritage Program Manager at LBL.
for providing the invaluable information. So a couple of interesting things that I kind of want to point out is that these two buildings were made of concrete and um, it just kind of strikes me being weird. I mean, really not many people built concrete homes back in the 60s, early early 40s up to the 60s, 70s. I mean, it's really not something you use to build a home out of unless you're building your basement or your foundation, um, which kind of leads me to believe that the people that lived here knew what they were getting into before they moved in, that, hey, there might be some sort of creature living out here, or creatures, excuse me, uh, whether it be Dogman or Bigfoot, or both. Um, I believe both of course. Uh, the pictures um, will that you guys are seeing the black and white and the colored version um, of Hotel California and then the Vampire Hotel. Also the coordinates to both are in the description once again. But the interesting thing um, it, once again is they were built of concrete which is very strange for back then. And then the mysterious room uh, that was talked about, the walkout basement was symmetrical, which would have suggested some type of commercial business, such as a hotel. The one exception to the symmetry was a room in the back of the basement toward the right. It is unclear what this room was used for, but what we do know is that it was a res residential home, not a hotel. <clears throat> Was this some kind of uh, safe room in case this home was, uh, you know, kind of walked in upon by a dog man or a Sasquatch? Who knows? But I just wanted to share some of the history of the LBL with you guys. Um, I find it fascinating. I hope you guys find it fascinating as well and like i said the gps coordinates are in the description and uh i for one um am going to hopefully make a trip to check out both of these places uh this summer um i just gotta find a babysitter because i'm definitely not taking my daughter bell with me <laughs> but uh yeah moving on to some encounters now Today's third part of the upload. Saltville, a small town in Smith and Washington counties of Virginia. The Boyd family owned a local restaurant and they agreed to operate a concession stand for a three-day church activity that was set to begin the next morning. They were in need of certain supplies which required them to get up early and drive to Saltville in order to, they could return back before the activities began later that morning. They were en route before 3 a.m. that morning and things had gone well until they made a wrong turn and found themselves driving along a narrow mountainous road in a desolate area. As they rounded a turn, they could see a high embankment on the right-hand side of the road. Suddenly they saw movement and they slowed down almost to a stop because they thought it was a deer about to run across the road in front of them. Daughter Pauline Boyd recalled the frightening experience that followed as it was later told to her by her parents. An animal leapt off the embankment toward their car and thrust its face right up against the passenger side window. Pauline stated that her mother reluctantly got a close-up view of the animal. She described the fur or hair on the monster as light colored with a white blaze of hair on its neck and stomach. It stood and walked on two large muscular legs and it displayed a pair of short front legs. The scary part was that the animal, which resembled a baboon, began to chase them and attack their car. She stated that her father stepped on the accelerator and sped away from the animal. As soon as he gained some ground on the animal, he stopped the car and stepped out with pistol in hand in the intent on taking a shot at the animal. 
Her mother convinced him to get back into the car because she was afraid that the monster would catch up to them and that the bullets would not stop it. Her father jumped back into the car and sped down the road towards Saltville. Upon their arrival into town, an inspection of the car revealed that the fierce animal attack had left deep scratch marks in the paint of the car. The scratch marks were configured in rows of three, which gave evidence that the creature had three claws on each foot. They said the animal, even though it bore a resemblance to both kangaroo and monkey, was not a kangaroo, a dog, or a bear, as some people tried to suggest. The daughter, Pauline, believes that her parents had an unfriendly encounter with a dog man. That was not the end of this creature's presence in Saltville. Two days later, in the same area, two nurses were driving home from work early in the morning when their car was attacked in a similar manner by a creature, meeting the same description, resembling a baboon. The animal managed to tear the canvas top off the convertible as it tried to get to the two passengers. The driver and passenger were very thankful that the vicious creature was unsuccessful and they were able to make a clean getaway in what was left of the car. A search party was organized and members of the group took along with their hunting dogs in pursuit of the animal. Once the party began to follow the creature's trail and its scent was picked up, the dogs began to behave strangely and refused to go any further. A third sighting in the Saltvale area occurred in the 90s. A couple had recently purchased a piece of property with a mobile home in the area to be used for weekends, holidays, and vacations. On that particular weekend, the couple and their two children were en route to Saltville for the weekend. They were traveling in their truck along a quiet highway that runs parallel to Interstate 81. As they approached the top of the hill, a large creature ran out into the roadway and forced the man to apply his brakes to avoid a collision. The creature was down on all four legs, and its front legs were shorter than its larger and much stronger looking rear legs. All four feet had sharp claws. It stood about three and a half feet when they saw it. But if it had stood up, they estimated it would have been at least six and a half feet. It was covered in gray hair or fur with a long nose and pointed ears. The creature crossed the highway, jumped the ditch line, ran through the weeds and then it hurtled a fence that ran along the road. The couple believes that the creature met the description of the dogman seen years prior. In 1973, a man was driving State Route 16 northward from Marion, Virginia to Tazewell, Virginia. The straight line distance between the two towns is 20 miles. He was crossing a mountain on Marion side, which is around 12 to 14 miles east of Saltville. When he encountered the creature he believes is the dog man. He was motoring up the winding mountain road with his window rolled down and his arm hanging out. Both sides of the road were heavily wooded in that area. When he heard a noise outside the car to his left, he turned to look in the direction just in time to see this terrible creature rushing the side of the car. The creature tried to grab his arm, prompting him to jerk it back inside and lay on the accelerator. He was so shaken that he never slowed down or looked back until he arrived at his destination. Several out-of-towners from Gouchland, Virginia, that were hunting in Saltville area recently claimed that they heard strange sounds described as some sort of monkey coming from the forest around where they were hunting. They have hunted all of their lives and never heard anything make that kind of sound before. They have not returned to Saltvale area since that time, and they do not intend to do so. Those visitors from Gouchland know firsthand a little something about the dogmen. In the November and December of 2010, several local citizens claimed they saw a strange creature in downtown Gouchland near the Gouchland County Courthouse Square Historic District, the historic Grace Episcopal Church, and its spooky old graveyard are also located nearby. 
There are a number of businesses located in the area. According to a witness, in one of the sightings, the creature stood up on all four legs, with its front legs being much shorter than its rear. It had pointed ears and a pronounced nose, and a long furry tail. All these descriptions meet those of a dog man. Witnesses claimed that the monster behaved in a menacing manner by showing its teeth and producing somewhat of a growling sound. Then it just ran off in a leaping fashion. Two other witnesses saw the creature, or one like it, a few miles away at the south end of Rock Castle Road, County Route 600 in 2010. The animal had a baboon-like appearance, and it stood up and walked across the road in front of their vehicle. The same witnesses saw the creature again nearly four years later, in June of 2014. The witness was traveling westward on County Route 6 towards Gouchland, and when they were about one and a half miles from town, the creature came out of the woods on the north side of the road and began to cross the road toward the river on the left. The witnesses slammed on the brakes, and the creature reversed its path and returned back across the road and into the woods from which it came. All of these witnesses believe they saw a dog man. All right, folks, just a quick little middle of the night or early morning bonus to help you get going into the day. Uh, a lot of information right there on the LBL with some very interesting picks. Uh, just wanted to share that with you. Guys, thank you for supporting the channel. Your support is honestly what makes this channel continue to grow and go. And what makes it a place where people can share their experiences, ideas, and theories without ridicule and judgment. Thank you for that. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant. Keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and they are dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions. Never stop searching for the answers. And... God bless.